Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. On today's podcast, we're going to be talking with Shannon Badger with the CPA firm here in San Antonio, talking about 1031 exchanges, second homes, inflation, taxes, depreciation, cost segregation, all kinds of great stuff. You got to listen in. Welcome to the Invest in San Antonio podcast, hosted by Brad Larson, real estate broker and founder of RentWorks Property Management in Military City, USA. San Antonio, Texas is one of the greatest places on earth to work, live, and raise a family. It's one of the fastest growing areas in the country. So together, let's take advantage of the rock solid economy along with the strong housing market. In this podcast, we'll interview some fantastic guests with conversations highlighting some of the best parts of the local real estate market and the people that make it great as we invest in San Antonio. Welcome everybody to another edition of the Invest in San Antonio podcast. I'm your host, Brad Larson, owner and founder of RentWorks, a property management company here in the San Antonio and Austin, Texas region. And today's guest, I'm bringing on Ms. Shannon Badger. Now, Shannon and her husband, Jonathan, they run the Badger and Badger CPA firm in San Antonio. So she is our accounting team. She is basically the the person that comes in and oversees what we do as RentWorks because if you haven't figured it out yet, property management companies at their finest are essentially wealth managers. They're asset managers, they're money managers because we're managing millions of dollars coming in, millions of dollars going out. And it's imperative that we have good accounting, which Shannon and her team is able to help us provide to our clients. Now, what we're going to talk about today is just kind of a few general accounting questions to talk about with Shannon. Uh, what's going on in the world with some 1031s, cost segregations, inflation, uh, taxes? I mean, all kinds of good stuff about owning rental properties that are good discussion points because if you don't understand the taxes behind running and owning rental properties, you're really missing the boat because people talk about appreciation, people talk about you know what's it cost, people, people talk about rent rates and vacancy rates and cap rates and all this other junk, but was hardly is ever factored in and it's unquantifiable because of everyone's tax situation is different, is the tax benefits. And so we're gonna try and illustrate some of those today. And so without further ado, I wanna bring on Shannon and have her introduce herself and we can kind of have a conversation from there. Shannon, how are you today? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Brad. Uh, my name is Shannon Badger. On. I'm one of the uh, partners here at Badger CPA Firm, and uh, we specialize in outsourced accounting for businesses. And um, real estate happens to be one of our um, kind of niches that we serve. And so a lot of our clients own real estate, investment properties, and things of that nature. And I've been working with Brad and his team now for about three years. Yeah, it's been fantastic. She was able to come in and really revamp our accounting process and bring it to the next level. And it's good to have. I mean, it's really good to have that because we owe it to our clients, our owners, our tenants, everybody that we work with, our staff, that we got to have good, solid accounting. So we have several layers. We have checks and balances. We've adopted the NARPM accounting standards. And so she's been able to help us do that with her team. And it provides us a great service to allow us to provide great service to our owners, clients. And so the big thing nowadays is the appreciation. I mean, we saw the appreciation. We had a big sell off this last 12 months, 18 months, mm -hmm. where everybody was turning around and selling their property. Uh, one little fun stat that we saw was we used to manage about mm, 40 homes that had in ground pools, which indicates that they were reluctant landlords because you wouldn't go buy a rental property that has an in ground pool intentionally. Mm -hmm. But uh, now we have less than 10, maybe six homes that have in ground pools that we manage, but our the homes we manage have gone up. So the numbers have gone up as far as homes mm -hmm. that we manage, but it shows the, the difference in the market. So uh, a lot of folks shrunk in size on the management company level. Uh, we actually grew because it's really a big transfer of wealth. What happened was the reluctant landlord sold and then new, more professional investors came in to purchase more properties. So what have you seen in just the last year in the real estate market with appreciation? Um, well, we've had a lot of uh, clients and businesses that are um, bringing in investors from kind of outside of the U.S. So we're seeing in Texas and San Antonio and South Texas specifically that there's just an increase of people wanting to uh, develop. And um, so our kind of home builder clients and also our commercial clients are all like they can barely keep up with the demand. And so it's really interesting um, kind of after COVID and the aftermath now, we're just seeing this huge a boom in anything that's touching construction, real estate, homes. Um, and, you know, obviously there's some s supply chain uh, barriers and things like that, but we haven't seen it slow down really, which has been interesting. I also think low interest rates are obviously impacting that, um, especially in the housing market right now, because interest rates are so low, people are able to afford 
maybe more expensive homes than they otherwise would because their monthly payments about the same. So I am, I'm kind of waiting for the interest rates to rise. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, when that will happen and what that's going to do to the housing market. So I'd be curious what your thoughts are there. Um, yeah, but right as, now as a, it just doesn't seem to be catching up with demand. Like you can't even get a house in Texas barely. It's very difficult. It's, it's been a difficult time right now is the 21st of March. We're recording this. They're talking about raising the rates even this week. Uh, the Fed was going down that quick. They were talking about even seven interest raises through the rest of this year, which I think would be baffling. But I would like to see maybe well, I don't like to see raises, but I would like to see only two or three if they're going to do it versus five or six or seven, because every time they're going to go up a quarter point right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to go up, you know, 0.001. They're going to go up a whole quarter point and you mm -hmm. put four quarter points together and that's a whole full point. And that, that can really impact interest rates uh, as far as on the consumer side, vehicles, homes, uh, credit mm -hmm. cards, etc. And so the interesting part of what you might be seeing on the commercial side is this is a industry phenomenon. It's, and we call it the build to rent model. And this is as a property management industry, we're seeing more and more companies coming in like Deal Horton, for example, and other big ones, or even smaller developers, and they're building whole neighborhoods, you know, 100, 200 single family home neighborhoods that are built to rent. Or you get the duplex neighborhoods where they're, you know, you might have 50 duplexes, which is really 100 homes, and uh, they're building just to rent them. Obviously, they're, they might sell them to investors, but they're going to rent them as well. They're not building them for owner occupants. What are you seeing in the market so far around that? Well, one thing I was going to ask you actually related to the same thing is, you know, people coming in now and buying homes to rent is just, I wouldn't think that the rental rates would be keeping up with the housing price inflation. So um, you would know more about that than me specifically, but it's interesting to me, these um, third party investors that are buying homes to rent, because I just wouldn't think that the cash flow, you know, scenario would be there for the rents in San Antonio specifically right now. Um, so, you know, if you're buying a home that maybe was, a three hundred thousand dollar home three years ago. It's probably a four fifty to five hundred thousand dollar home now. And so, how do you you know purchase that and then rent it and still cash flow even with low interest rates? It doesn't seem to be you know sufficient cash flow to justify that increased price. Um, well, but, here's the here's the thing on that. So you're right. It has gone down because you know back when I first started twenty years ago in real estate, it was a the it was the one percent rule, right? So you could buy a hundred thousand dollar home and you could rent it for a thousand dollars right the hundred thousand dollar sales price equals the monthly rent one percent right the one percent mm -hmm. rule and that's drifted it's gone down to you know point zero eight you know now excuse me point eight not point zero eight it's gone down to point seven even i mean you really start it's drifting down austin's even worse i mean they're mm -hmm. they're at a point five and so it is going down there but as mentioned in the in the opening monologue is because of the tax appreciation, taxes and the appreciation combined, you see uh, paying less in taxes, uh, you see cost segregation, which we could talk about. Uh, you also see the appreciation. I mean, you know, for example, we work with a uh, institutional buyer called ILE Homes. Mm -hmm. And I think we manage about a dozen of their homes right now and they're buying all the time. They want, they have an appetite to buy 50 or 75 more just this year. And that's a difficult challenge is to find them homes that fit into their box because they have a little buy box where it's got to meet a certain criteria, a certain age, a certain uh, price point and a certain rental value amount. And so that's their buy box. And that buy box is kind of where they stick to uh, versus like, hey, I want to buy this rental property because I love the shutters and I think it's a good school district. You know, that, that's not the way anymore. They really go down to the numbers. And in those formulas here, I'm going to try and make a point. In the formulas they use and the and the the way they've been buying homes for a while, they do have the algorithms to take into account depreciation and taxes as far as what they can, are able to uh, write off, for example, and make it worth their while. And they're they're banking on the appreciation. I mean, that's that's they know it's a solid investment. People look at the stock market as like I don't know what's going on in the stock market. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. But they know real estate is solid with the tax benefits I mentioned and the leverage you can do 20 different things with. So there's there's always going to be a good solid need for the real estate market investments, which has made property management even more valuable. People are looking to come into this space from Wall Street, from big time hedge fund money, and they're putting in, in all this these funds into property management and real estate just because they know it's a solid investment. 
which mm -hmm. leads to cool things for you guys who help us manage our investors, manage mm -hmm. our taxes and work with them. Now, some of the yeah. investors you work with, uh, you see anything, I mean, are they complaining about the, the cash flow? Are they looking at different angles? Are they selling um, for a certain reason, buying for a certain reason? One thing that's interesting is because the rates are so low, we have some investors that, you know, historically would maybe pay cash for properties. So you have more people uh, maybe financing that wouldn't have financed before because it's, you know, to them, it feels like free money. And so they're able to be a little more aggressive than they normally would be. Um, and then we're also seeing an increase in 1031 exchanges where people are maybe wanting to upgrade the type of property or switch to a different location, things like that, where they're saying, okay, well, now's a really good time for me to, you know, unload this property on this lake because I want to go upgrade and get something nicer over here. And so we're seeing a lot of people, um, you know, buying their second home, third home. Um, they're just seeing it as like a good opportunity to do that. I also think you have more people working from home and having more flexibility in their work lives now where they want to invest in more second homes, third homes, beach houses, things like that, because they can work from wherever. And so that's given people additional flexibility to own, um, you know, more properties and actually be able to use them. Yeah, let's talk about a couple before. things there, because I want to hear your perspective on the 1031 exchange. Now, I could try to butcher the explanation. A lot of people that would even listen to this podcast have heard of the concept, but mm -hmm. you know, many, very few have actually done one. And you've seen them from the CPA level done probably a bunch of times. Try to explain that for the layperson, what a 1031 exchange really is. Sure. Um, a 1031 exchange is essentially, um, it's a like property exchange. And one thing that's interesting is that it started way back when, when people would exchange land or farmland and things like that, where basically if one person was transferring, let's say hundred acres of land from one person to the other, it was pretty much the same thing. So they're saying, well, I shouldn't have to pay the government a large amount of tax on this because I'm literally buying and selling the same thing. Um, so that's kind of where it started. Um, so basically a 1031 exchange is you are selling one property and you're buying something that's a like property. Um, so it's called a like kind exchange. And so if you have, let's say one rental property and you're going to sell that property. Um, so let's say you purchased it for 200,000, you can sell it for 300. So you have a, a gain of a hundred thousand, um, instead of paying tax on that hundred thousand, you can keep that full 300 sales price in an escrow account essentially. And then you can invest that 300,000 into a different property a like property, similar property, um, a different rental property, let's say that's maybe a little bit nicer, a little bit upgraded. And you can basically roll that whole um, 300,000 into a new investment without paying capital gains tax. So um, people really use it if they're wanting to, let's say it's a good time to sell this property, but they want to invest in something different. Um, it's a good chance for them to essentially pull cash out of one and invest it into another without paying tax. And, and the premise of that is really if you're you know, selling one home and buying another home, um, that you shouldn't have to pay tax on that gain because you're just exchanging similar properties. What are some of the, the stipulations and ramifications of doing all that? Because you have these these boundaries. You got to do a certain time frame. Uh, you have to go through a, a, a title company that has some sort of mediator type thing. Explain through mm -hmm. some of the processes of that. Yes. Um, so you have to have like an intermediary of some kind. So they, they call it a qualified intermediary. And so usually CPA or CPA firm actually can't um, be your intermediary, intermediary for you. Um, so there's lots of companies out there that that's kind of all that they do is 1031 exchange, um, intermediary work. And so they'll help make sure you're kind of checking all the boxes. Uh, the other piece of it is you can't actually touch the cash. So the funds have to go straight when you close, uh, from that title company straight to this intermediary where it sits there. Um, until you're ready to buy your other property. And so if those funds are uh, distributed to you, and then you try to do a 1031 exchange, you've already broken it because you can never have the cash actually be in your, um, you know, under your ownership or accessible to you. It has to always go through a third party intermediary. Um, so the relinquished property being sold and then your replacement property being bought has to be like in kind, which generally speaking, it means any type of investment property can pretty much qualify for an exchange. Um, there's some weird rules, like if it's your primary residence versus investment property, usually doesn't qualify. Um, or also, you know, you couldn't like sell a car and then go buy a house. But as long as you're dealing with um, investment properties, generally it would qualify. And then you also have a, a 45 day identification period. So from the day you sell your first property, you only have 45 days to identify your next one. And so that's something that 
gets people sometimes is, and especially in this market, because it's really hot. So you might be able to identify that property, but you might not be able to close fast enough um, to get it. And I'm trying to remember the close date now off the top of my head. I want to say you have to close within. I thought it was six months. I was going to say, I think you're right. Um, but I know you have a 45 day identification period and then there's a close window, which honestly, I can't remember the exact time off, off the top of yeah, my head. But yeah, I don't you, expect you to be, uh, you know, have that all by memory because well, you're not conducting those, but you understand no, the concept. But let's say you have to close within six months. So let's say you find a property within 45 days and then you can't, or like you get outbid and outbid and outbid. So that's what we're seeing right now is somebody might think they can do a 1031, but they can't like close on the other property fast enough because they keep getting outbid for things and they can't get anything under contract. So we have seen that happen once or twice um, where someone thought they were going to be able to do one and then they just couldn't because the market is unusual right now. Um, and then there's also cost segregation studies, which a lot of investors do, which essentially helps you accelerate your depreciation. So when you buy um, any kind of like rental residence or office building, warehouse, um, anything like that, you have rental properties have about a 27 and a half year uh, depreciation period. And then your commercial properties have a 39 year depreciation period. And so if you were to buy that asset, let's say a $2 million commercial building, you have to depreciate that over 39 years. So there's not a lot of tax benefit for depreciation up front. But when you uh, buy that property cost segregation, what it does is it says, okay, there's, there's lots of elements in that purchase, including like uh, plumbing, fixtures, um, fencing, sidewalks, stuff like that. And so if you were to purchase those assets by themselves, you'd be able to depreciate them over maybe five years, seven years, 15 years. And so a cost seg study is essentially you get a, um, it's usually done by like an engineering company of some kind, but they come in and look at that commercial property and they'll say, okay, you bought a $2 million property and now we're going to take that $2 million purchase price and we're going to split it into these buckets. Like how much is five year depreciate, you know, can we depreciate over five, seven, 15, and then the 39. And so you're usually able to accelerate depreciation for generally we see maybe um, a third to a half of the purchase price. And so it's um, it's a huge tax benefit to invest in that. And cost seg studies usually cost between, you know, maybe five to ten thousand dollars, depending on who you're working with. Um, so we had one investor, for example, he purchased a three million dollar ranch, and he invested ten thousand dollars into a cost seg study. But he was able to depreciate, I think it was like eight hundred thousand um, dollars additional. So it saved him, you know, about three hundred fifty thousand dollars of taxes. So it was kind of worth it, you know, all day to do that. Um, yeah. And then you can take that money and go invest in something else instead of, you know, waiting 39 years to get the benefit. So that's how that works. That's for, and you can do that every year or just one time? One time for one property. Um, but like we had another client, um, they own maybe eight rental properties. And so they just did it in one year. Well, they knocked off about 100000 of taxes. And then they could go use that as down payment on several more. And so I think a lot of people, they would rather save their tax now um, and go invest now at low interest rates into like more properties, basically. Um, right, they could, they could have taken that hundred. Mm -hmm. Right, they could have taken a hundred thousand in leverage and bought four properties. You know, twenty five thousand exactly. down payment each, and so that's what a lot of these investors are doing. You know, we always run into the challenges of lenders where only you know they have a ten home limit. You know, the old FHA standby limit. Then you start getting into the conventional world, and you know they're twenty to twenty five percent down, right? Typically, mm -hmm. and so you have to often go to smaller banks to do this because the bigger banks, you know, they kind of cap you out as well. So it's not as easy to just go out and get loans as we mm -hmm. say, we talk about it in theory. And in addition, so I wanna talk about the, the 1031 exchange. Are you able to do that into the commercial realm? So you sell, yes. you know, if you rental properties and go buy a commercial building, are you able to do that? Um, yes, my understanding is it, it kind of depends. I think there's like some, you know, checklists, but you basically, as long as it's an investment property, there's a high likelihood you'll be able to do it. Yeah, that's kind of what we did at RentWorks, as you saw me do, mm -hmm. uh, so we sold, I sold four of my rental properties and then we're building a new office for RentWorks. And so that should be complete sometime, well, this time next year or sooner in 23, you should be occupying moving in, which you'll be probably looking to do a cost segregation study on that thing and sometime in 23 or 24. So we don't get killed on, on the taxes there, but that'll be a neat thing for, for RentWorks, you know, kind of moving on up as they say, mm -hmm. uh, getting into a little bit nicer digs and, uh, you know, just making it, you know, solidifying the, the RentWorks company as the marquee property management company here in the San Antonio region. Now, the, the cost segregation, 
and all the 1031 stuff, it kind of boils down into, I was just trying to explain this yesterday on the golf course to a friend of mine. He just sold a company of his and he's got, he's probably sitting on seven figures or something. He's looking to buy investment real estate. Uh, his wife is a mortgage officer. And so he understands the numbers, but he asked me point blank, you know, we're, we're, teeing or we're, we're putting on the 12th hole and he's like well do you, do you still think single family homes are a good investment i'm like heck yeah they are and for all the reasons that we just talked about you and i 1031 uh cost of irrigation and i boil it down i've been doing this for years i say look between your income your taxes and everything else essentially you are getting like a ten thousand dollar a year write-off for a two hundred thousand dollar home now i know that's probably fuzzy math but i was just trying to illustrate it real generically so if you had a ten thousand dollar a year write-off and you own 10 properties but you made a hundred thousand dollars in your w-2 income job essentially you'd pay no tax right hundred thousand dollars ten thousand dollars each deduction times ten i know that's really broad and you're shaking your head i'm like brad you have no idea what you're talking about but that's where well, people for they don't they don't see that big picture of how they can reduce their taxable income and so that's what i always want to try to talk about and again i've said it before it's unquantifiable because everyone has a different tax situation and so for me to even throw that broad term out there it's kind of risky just to say that stuff but i'm trying to illustrate the point of uh, if you get a really good one a, an appreciating asset and a tax deductible asset that can save you more than you can ever reckon because you start talking tax brackets right you know you have a 37 percent and then down to 25 whatever those are but what if you say you magically saved yourself you know 10 cents in taxes and you kicked yourself down from 37 percent to 25 percent i mean imagine the savings in that alone so that's what a lot of people do and that's what you do for us when you work with us on our taxes uh making sure that we're squared away with the irs uh, we do all the, the stuff to stay current, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we do all the right things, but uh, it's interesting. I want to talk about that a little bit, the power of depreciation, the power of tax benefits in the single family home residential rentals. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I want to talk about is that, you know, for a lot of our clients, most of them are business owners. And so they have some kind of company. And, um, you know, if the business is cash flowing and making money, like you're going to pay probably lots of taxes and not. and without, I mean, there's a few levers you can pull. Um, you know, there is like accelerated depreciation on asset purchases and things like that. But you know, I always tell my clients like real estate investment is really one of the only avenues where you can really um, invest in an asset that's probably going to appreciate in value that you're not gonna have to pay tax on, you know, until later, or you can exchange that into something else. Um, now, eventually, if you were to sell all your investment properties, you will pay tax, like at some point, you know, you're not gonna put it off forever. But I do see um, real estate just as being one of the best uh, strategies you can take from a tax perspective, if you're looking for avenues to, you know, stash cash, invest in something that's gonna have, you know, favorable tax consequences, like real estate, is one of my favorites. You know, there's some other more aggressive things like captive insurance and things like that. Um, some like, you know, complicated, you know, life insurance plans and whatnot. But for me, like having a hard asset, like a building or a house is always preferable. Um, the other piece of that is with rates being so low now in inflation, it, like having a lot of money in your bank account, um, which this is just my opinion, right? It's different for everyone. But I mean, people are feeling like if, you know, let's say you have $100,000 in your bank account right now, um, at the rate that inflation is going, it's probably not going to be worth a ton of money sitting in your bank, you know, four, three, four years from now, because um, the inflation environment is just so crazy right now. And so, you know, the my, you know, personal opinion is that if you're investing in a hard asset like real estate, it's probably a better use of funds right now. So not saying you don't want to still have like your safety net and your emergency fund and be, you know, fiscally responsible and keeping some cash in the bank. But, you know, if you have a million dollars cash just sitting there, it's probably not highest and best use. So well, I agree. Uh, and and that, that brings up a whole nother conversation. This, this could be a whole series of podcasts, just like how do you get into buy real estate? Because assuming people are listening to us, they might have one, they might have two type single family residential homes or multifamilies, whatever they might have. But the buying side right now is challenging. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you're seeing this with other investors that you might be working with. Hey, I want to go buy 10 homes, but finding them is the really challenge hard. because it's very hard. And, and one of it is because we have those institutional buyers that are now in the market and mm -hmm. they're looking at homes from a distance on the multiple listing service. And they're just making sight unseen offers, paying potentially over list price. And that's how they're looking to acquire because in their numbers, uh, it makes a lot more sense to get it at any cost at this point 
and then let it appreciate and tax, you know, get the tax benefits out of it now. And so it's just a challenge for for investors. You know, we have several pro- programs at RentWorks to where they can become a pocket investor. So we we come up with pocket listings where our current homes that we manage, if they wanted to sell for whatever reason, doing a 1031 or moving out or whatever, they come to us and say, hey, we want to sell. Before we go on the multiple listing service and put it out there to the general public, we take that home, package it, and throw it to our investors that are on our list, the, the ones that have already been working with us, the ones that have already been uh, screened, that, that want to work with us to continue to allow us to manage their homes. We present that to them. So they have a leg up on the market in that regard because you know commissions are less. They're not going on the open market. They're not doing showings. It's, it's a good way for investors to break in by getting into that, that pocket listing format. But if you're not in there, I mean, the MLS is not, is not a, a bad uh, place to be. No, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we had a few um, friends and people that we know, like just moving in from out of state. And uh, I think unless you know somebody that's going to kind of have a, you know, pocket listing or whisper listing or whatever, it's like, if you don't know somebody that knows the market, knows what's coming available, it's very challenging to go like the conventional, like real estate agent route. You're going to be um, you know, bidding on a house, there's probably going to be 20 offers and it's just going to be a grind. And so knowing somebody that can, you know, basically get like the one up and kind of the scoop on those things before they hit the market really is, you know, the way to be successful right now. Um, we've seen people try to go like on their own and I mean, it's, it's almost impossible right now. It's very hard. Yeah, it's very difficult. And so the state of the real estate market, uh, we are going to see a bit of a slowdown with the interest rates and, um, it's funny how everything just kind of boomed in a perfect storm with mm-hmm. with COVID, uh, people vacating blue states, people going to remote work, working at home. Uh, they're thinking, why would I sit in a in a you know crappy condo in New York when I can move to Texas and have a house three times the size, but I can still work every day and service the stock market or whatever their situation was. You, you could describe a thousand of them. Uh, you know that's that's allowed a lot of people to also get, get second homes. So mm-hmm. I want to talk about that because the second home scenario, uh, I talked about it before on a previous show where uh, a short-term rental manager was encouraging people to look at buying a second home as an investment property. And then when they're not occupying it, you know, let's say for a month out of the year, they turn it into a short-term rental. So mm-hmm. what? tell me what, kind of what you know about that type of scenario. Um, so the IRS has this 14-day rule and it's kind of basically it says if you use a house more than 14 days or so, um, it's considered like a second home instead of an investment property. And so there are um, a little bit different rules, but generally if you're even using it, let's say 25% of the year and you are renting it out, you can still take kind of a prorated percentage of, um, you know, you're, you'll have to claim your rental income, but then you also have some depreciation and expenses, utilities, things like that. It's just that you can't, you know, deduct or expense the portion that you're using it personally. So, um, so you do kind of have to track like what days you're using it versus renting it. Um, but that's not super difficult. And then if you're using it less than 14 days, you know, you can just call it like a pure investment property and pretty much take mostly all of it. Um, it's just once you get over 14 days, you know, you have a little more gymnastics to do, but, um, we think it's a great time to do that right now. We're recommending that to our clients as well. Again, it's like, if you have a bunch of cash in the bank, it's a good time to buy a second home right now a hard asset, you might be paying a little bit more, but um, the money in the bank's not probably going to do you much good. Is that 14 consecutive days? Um, I believe it's 14 days throughout the year. Aggregate total. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm asking the dumb questions, right? I think so. Right. Because some people think, well, I I could spend a week here and six days here and I'm still under the IRS threshold. You know, Uh, I'm just, I'm just being just kind of colored, coloring the pages, I guess. So it's basically like, you know, you don't um, have to claim like rental income either, um, but it's just kind of, you can't take your personal residence, you know, basically expenses and take them. And so what they're trying to say is, you know, if you're using it more than that, then, you know, it's really got more like personal use. And so then you have to kind of figure out um, how much you want to take and things like that. So what are you seeing for second home financing scenarios out there in the market? Oh, good question. Gosh. Um, You know, I don't know that I have seen, I haven't seen um, the actual financing terms recently. I I should know that off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, We have clients that have invested in some and sent me over paperwork, but I 
I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I mean, rates are obviously more favorable than usual. We have seen some people able to do like a 10 or 20% down. Um, I don't usually see less than that. We're also seeing um, people doing like cash out refinances sometimes. So sometimes they might try to get like a family friend or someone to loan them so they can pay cash and then they'll go finance it on the back end um, just for the sake of time and speed. Um, but other than that, I don't know that I could speak intelligently really about the, the financing for second homes right now. Yeah, there's an interesting uh, phenomenon that's really coming around, and I forget the term or what they call it, but it's essentially like these bridge loans, uh, power buyers. They call them power buyers. I just thought of it. And these are folks that are basically, okay, Shannon, you want to move from house A to house B. Uh, well, you need the money out of house A to buy house B. These power buyers basically go buy house B for you with cash. Right. And then as soon as, you know, the loan is closed, they put it into your name and then you own that home house B. Then you turn around, and sell house A to potentially them. Like they're, the power buyers often buy your house A to get you into house B. But the point of that is you become a cash buyer for house B, not an FHA buyer, not a VA buyer, which nobody even talks to any longer. Uh, you become an actual cash buyer and gives you some real leverage. It's the Absolutely. old concept of bridge loan. Right. It's the old Absolutely. concept. Right. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we're seeing more and more on the market now. And I think they're going to be, uh, I'm sure they're doing second homes as well. I'm, I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. And because that's a good way if you're really trying to house hack, which is, you know, mm -hmm. the bigger pockets term house hack, uh, you could potentially buy a second home investment, um, you know, put your 20% down and get into the market that way and have a little bit of a flavor or taste of what you do or what you like in the short-term rental homes. Now, you can't go buy six second homes with financing, but you know mm -hmm. if you're if you're the the second home financing versus the the commercial investor financing, they're not going to be much different. They're going to be very similar in interest rates. Uh, you know, if you buy a commercial. Uh, property for rentals, like a, like a investment type property, you're going to spend, you know, a point to two points higher on the interest rate. But you know, at the end of the day, who cares when appreciation is far greater and depreciation with basically inflation is worse than what you're paying in interest. Like you said, because if a simple math, if your inflation is 8% and your interest rates 5%, I mean, it, you know, like your investors would tell you it's free money. Absolutely. And we're seeing, um, you know, an increase in like cash out refinances to refinances of personal property, you know, like a lot of people rates, you know, were maybe I want to say between four and five, like not that long ago. And a lot of people were refinancing from kind of like seven to eight down to four to five. And then now they're even lower. And so we're seeing a lot of people um, do refinances of like their primary and try to pull cash out to then go invest that cash in something else because their monthly payments not really changing they're able to pull um you know cash out and then go do something else with it yeah good good stuff so this has been a really cool conversation just to kind of catch up on the real estate market with you and introduce you to our our folks at rentworks uh this is our accounting team now we uh we would put you in contact with them, but they're really getting to, to reiterate this. It's not their focus is working with the individual investor. They work with more businesses, not saying they wouldn't help you, uh, but just saying, you know, that's that's not their niche. There's lots of other real estate attorneys or real estate CPAs in the, the marketplace that, that handle the one-off owners. Now, I think our multiple property owners, I think we have roughly 25 or so that manage, mm -hmm. or excuse me, they own, you know, four or more homes. And so we have quite a few of those, but really Shannon's team helps RentWorks keep our finances top notch. And that is a part of our service. This is what we do as, as property managers. We're money managers in conjunction with managing those properties. So Shannon, really cool conversation. Glad you came on today. Uh, if somebody want to reach out to you, what's your best website to find you? Um, our website is uh, badgercpa.com, so it's pretty easy to remember. Um, it's badger like the animal. And then my uh, personal email is shannon.badger at badgercpa.com. But um, if anybody has just any general questions or anything, I would love to help. Good. No, I appreciate you coming on. It's been a cool conversation and look forward to seeing you soon in and around the new RentWorks office. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Brad. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Shannon. Bye.